Therefore, it's time for members' statements. The member from Stormont Dundas, South Glengarry. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, in my riding of Stormont Dundas and South Glengarry, we are blessed with many dedicated volunteers that make such a difference in people's everyday lives. Last week, during National Volunteer Week, I was pleased to join a large number of volunteers from 22 different service clubs and community groups in South Stormont at their annual Volunteer Appreciation Gala in Long Sioux to thank them for all the work that they do. At the ceremony, they also recognized Ray Beauregard with South Stormont's 2018 Fran LaFlamme Volunteer of the Year Award. I first got to know Ray when I joined him on County Council in 2003. By that time, Ray had already spent many years of community work behind him as his volunteering efforts started when he was just 26 years old. Over his five decades of community work, Ray has helped to improve the lives of his neighbours and community by making time in his busy schedule to work with many different local volunteer organizations, including the YMCA, Lions Club, Knights of Columbus, Bee Farmers of Stormont County, Sports Hall of Fame Committee, Children's Aid Society, and the Long Sioux Friendly Circle Seniors Club, amongst others. Over 600 hours of volunteer service on an annual basis. Ray does a lot of volunteering in the car, driving for the SDNG Children's Aid Society and for Children's Treatment Center, logging over 18,000 kilometers and over 300 hours each year. Wow. I want to congratulate Ray Beauregard and his loyal and enthusiastic assistant, his wife Marlene, for this very deserving award. Ray and Marlene, you truly make a difference. Further members' statements. The member from Windsor to come to. The speaker, this Saturday, thousands of us across Ontario will hold ceremonies commemorating the Workers' Day of Mourning. It's not something we look forward to, but it's essential that we remind everyone of the need for workplace safety. Across Canada in 2016, 905 men and women were killed on the job. 905. Among those dead, six teenagers and another 20 who had yet to reach the age of 25. Last year in Ontario, we lost 54 people, 54 poor souls who left for work in the morning and never returned at the end of their shift. One would have been too many, and we lost 54. So far this year, we're at 15. One of them is 24-year-old Michael Gerald Cobb, he was killed in a freak accident in Windsor at a place where concrete girders are built. A second worker suffered serious injuries in the same incident. We need to treat our injured workers with more respect. We need the WSIV to do a better job of assisting our injured workers. Speaker, we hold our annual service to honour the dead and to fight for the living. We demonstrate to the families left behind that they are not alone. We share their grief. We're doing our part to make working life safer for everyone. When you see the flags lowered at municipal, provincial, and federal buildings this weekend, use the occasion to speak to your friends and families about the need for workplace safety. Tell, talk to your children and grandchildren. Remind them to make sure they have the proper training and supervision to do their jobs properly so they don't become part of next year's statistics. Thank you. Thank you. Further members' statements, the member from Guelph. Yes, thank you, Speaker. On April 20th, I was at Guelph City Hall to share some exciting news about our province's fight against climate change. Like many across Ontario, people in Guelph are worried about climate change and the threat it poses to our ecosystems, our food systems, our economy, and our way of life. Community-based emissions reduction projects are essential to achieving Ontario's greenhouse gas reduction goals, and that's why we created the Municipal Greenhouse Gas Fund. Through the fund, Ontario is supporting projects that will help reduce greenhouse gas pollution and save money on energy costs for municipalities like Guelph. I'm happy to share that the City of Guelph is receiving up to $315,000 to fund a, a digester gas storage system at their wastewater treatment facility. When sewage treatment produces excess methane gas, they will be able to store the gas instead of burning off the gas, thus reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And they can then use that stored gas instead of natural gas, reducing their fuel costs. 
The great news is that the Municipal GHG Challenge Fund is part of our Climate Change Action Plan and is funded by Ontario's cap-and-trade carbon market, which, of course, would be cancelled if the Conservatives win the election. Shame. Thank you. Thank you. Shame. Further member statements? The member from Huron-Bruce. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Last week, I had the pleasure of visiting Bruce Power with the Ontario PC leader, Doug Ford, and the great MPP from Bruce Gray Owen Sound, Bill Walker. We were very impressed by the hardworking people who are dedicated to keeping the lights on in Ontario in a clean, affordable, and reliable manner. We were all impressed by the incredible attention to detail on safety throughout the facility. During our visit, we had the opportunity to meet with the nuclear operators of Bruce B and present to them a scroll of congratulations for Bruce Power's achievement for operational excellence, specifically for Unit 8. In fact, Speaker, Unit 8 had a remarkable 623 days of continuous safe operations from May 31, 2016 to February 13, 2018, thereby setting a new long-run record for the site. I have come to know the high-skilled professionals who work there, and they are dedicated to excellence, and because of that, it is fair to say that Bruce Power will be a clean, affordable, reliable source of baseload power for our energy mix for decades to come. And not only does Bruce Power directly employ many members of our community, they also work tirelessly to make our community a better place by sponsoring community initiatives and ensuring that economic benefits and development from the facility reach every corner of the riding. And for that, I say thank you and congratulations. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Further members' statements. The member from Hamilton East, Stony Creek. Thank you, Speaker. Rent prices are getting brutal, and many people from Hamilton East and Stony Creek are livid. Frankly, they have a right to be. I recently heard from my constituent, Kevin, who said that they are forcing people out of his building by buying his neighbors out and jacking up rent prices. Management is even justifying high increases after making minimal cosmetic changes to the building. This activity has recently been coined renovictions. Stories like Kevin are flowing every day into my office. Even a good friend of mine has told me that his building, his newest neighbors, are paying almost twice what he is a month. This is getting out of hand. Yesterday, I was glad to see my fellow New Democrat, Peter Tabins, calling out the government for these unjust renovictions. It's not just happening in Hamilton. This is a systematic problem across our province, everywhere you go. We have got to make changes here. We need to close the renoviction loopholes. But the issues facing many Ontarians go beyond just affordable housing. This is about poverty reduction in, in general. There was one statement from Kevin that stuck out in my mind. He said, I'm doing okay, I'm barely getting by, but what about people on ODSP or others on welfare? Our province is condemning Ontarians to a life of poverty and homelessness, pushing them out of their apartments with high prices and giving them no resources to help themselves. My Bill 30 would solve that problem. It would create an evidence-based research commission to recommend what social assistance rates need to be year to year and in each region. If we pass Bill 30, another part of the problem would be solved. Today I'm standing here and asking the Premier, will you commit to enacting Bill 30 and eliminating renoviction loopholes because many Ontarians can't make it anymore? Thank you. Member Stamis, the member from Eglinton Lawrence. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to rise today to uh, give honour to a very courageous uh, police constable in my riding who works out of 32 Division, and uh, he is known as the cop that wouldn't shoot. And uh, his name is uh, Constable Ken Lamb out of 32 Division. I want to praise all his colleagues under uh, Superintendent uh, Rob Johnson of 32 Division for the incredible work that it did, especially Ken Lamb, who is now uh, being recognized all over the world as such a smart and a compassionate and tough cop. I also want to uh, mention uh, that this horrible uh, tragedy that occurred on Young Street is not going to let good people down. That people are still saying, we are not going to let this deter us from being good Canadians. And in fact, the mother of and father of Anne-Marie D'Amico, who was lost in the tragic accident, uh, said in their statement, her name has been broadcast around the world attached to this terrible tragedy, but we want everyone to know that she embodied the definition of altruism. It comforts us knowing that the world has a chance to know her, and we hope that at, in this time, people fight with the same altruism 
rather than anger and hatred. Rest in peace, Anne-Marie D'Amico, and all the other victims of this horrible tragedy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Further members' statements, the member from Thornhill. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'm very pleased to rise today and give a statement on uh, Believe to Achieve, the new pilot program of To Be Empowered, Inc. And I want to mention uh, the CEO of To Be Empowered, uh, Sandra Finkelstein, and she's working with Spider Jones, who's the founder of Believe to Achieve, and they've created a one-year program to equip youth aged 15 to 29 with the skills that they need to succeed. Young Ontarians entering our labour market today, we all know, require new skills and abilities that previous generations may have not, and this organization is looking to build the gaps in our education system and address the gap in skills needed to navigate this new economy. Youth that have been marginalized by economic barriers to success face a more pronounced set of obstacles as well, and fortunately this program looks to address that gap by focusing on three key areas, including communication, financial literacy, and leadership. And uh, we all know that uh, the member for Nipsing has been a strong advocate for financial literacy in our youth. And uh, with the announcement today from the AG, we all know how important that is. Uh, in terms of communication, well, we all know we do a lot of talking here, a lot of communication, and the basis of a d our democracy, after all, is about communication, mm -hmm. communicating ideas and motivating people and sharing the values that we think is important. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Further members' statements? The member from Mississauga, Brampton South. Uh, Mr. Speaker, recently I had the pleasure of attending the grand opening of the new skilled trade center at the Sheridan College in my great riding of Mississauga, Brampton South. This three-story, 130,000 square foot facility is the new home for skilled trades and apprenticeship programs. This center offers students the opportunity to study electrical, mechanical, plumbing, building, and many other trades. For those who wish to enter any of those trades but are not sure of the path, Sheridan College offers a technology fundamentals program where students can learn about these trades before making a specialty selection. Apprenticeships and programs like the one at Sheridan College provide valuable skills that lead to great careers and good paying job opportunities. If the 2018 budget is passed, our government will be investing $170 million over the next three years in the new Ontario apprenticeship system. This will improve the skills of our workforce and give Ontario businesses a strong competitive advantage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Further member statements? The member from Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to share an important message from the Heart and Strokes 2018 Heart Report and do so in support of their just launched hashtag Time to See Red campaign. Women's heart and brain health is still vastly under-researched and misunderstood, and we still have a lot to learn about how to keep women from dying unnecessarily. Historically, heart disease and stroke were seen as men's diseases. Research was based on the incorrect assumption that what worked for a man would work for a woman. We are now learning how women's physiology and hormonal changes put them at risk for heart disease and stroke in ways that are different than men. This knowledge needs to make its way into better diagnostics, treatments, and support that work for women. In other words, it's time for change, Mr. Speaker. It's time to better understand women's hearts and brains, to make sure women's symptoms are investigated and the risks evaluated appropriately. And one way the members here can help inspire action among the research community, funders, healthcare workers, and system leaders is to help raise awareness about the need to transform women's heart health. Hashtag Time to See Red is a powerful new heart and stroke awareness campaign that shines a spotlight on the gap in women's heart and brain health by revealing how the system must do better to diagnose, treat, and support women. The campaign is a call to action to galvanize people in Canada to push for and make changes. This is about raising awareness so we can work together, public, health professionals, health systems, and governments, to close the gap in women's health. I thank Heart and Stroke's Avril Gofredo, Liz Scanlon, Orly Joseph, and Emily Fan for ensuring this important message was heard at Queen's Park, and I encourage everyone to spread the word. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank all members for their statements. It's their